All right, guys, so I'm going to explain to you guys how asymptotic complexity works because a lot of people don't actually understand time complexity as much as they think they do. They just see like a for loop and be like, oh, this is O of N or whatever. Or, or there's a, there are two for loops, there's O of N squared or whatever. So first of all, let's say I give you an algorithm. Let's say you found out something really cool. I don't know, right now there's the coronavirus, right? Let's say you found out a way to track every single person's coronavirus. So many people out there with coronavirus, right? And you're trying to track them down right and you finally de developed this novel algorithm that just able to track down all these people well then how can we measure the speed of this algorithm on other types of devices right because like one device could be way faster than the other one could be processing way faster and like faster cpu time might take um uh some slower machines might take f slower right so what do we do well what do we do first we pretty much we're gonna do is that we're gonna give you a bunch of data points, okay? And then we are going to calculate the time it takes for every single data point. So let's say I give you a certain number of data points. This is called N, whatever, the input size, right? So like 10 data points, 10 to 20 data points, whatever. And you are going to calculate the time for every single one. You measure it, you measure the time, you measure how long it takes, for this algorithm to run. And then what do we do? We graph every single data point with whatever time. So like, let's say we might get something like this. All right, maybe your algorithm does something like that. Okay, uh, this is after when we graph everything. Well, we can't really analyze this, right? We can't find the speed of this, right? So what do we do? We approximate it, right? We approximate it, we create a mathematical approximation function using your algorithm. So then it might look something like that. Let's call this f of n, let's connect all the dots. It might look something like that. This function might have some crazy, crazy, I don't know, ridiculous five sine square of, I don't know, 3.2 pi x plus, I don't know, some weird starting value, um, uh, tan inverse of whatever pi or something like 24 or whatever. Th this, fu math, this function might have some ridiculous, crazy thing. And what can we do with this? Very hard to analyze some crazy constants that you have interfering with this, this algorithm. So what do we do? What computer scientists do is that they find a boundary, okay? They're gonna bound whatever function between two lines. Let's say this is your function. We're gonna bound it between here and we're gonna bound it between here. So if we bound this function between these two lines, it is much easier, much, much easier to analyze it. And when our input size becomes way too much, if our input size goes 1 million users or 1,000 or 100,000 or a billion people, it's much easier to find the time it takes to do this. You might be able to change your algorithm and do whatever it wants. And let's call this first point C1, G of N. C1 is just one constant of this function G of N that we bounded it to. And then what we do is we, we try to find a function so that you could bound it to such that there's two, exists two constants that it's between. So it's a, the, the exact same function as the original one, this and this, except there's just a different constant. So then if we're able to bound it between these two lines, exact same function, just with different constants, it is much easier to analyze if you think about it. So what do we call this? We call this theta notation. So F of N is now bounded between theta of G of N. So what does that mean? It means that it is within a constant factor of a tightly bounded of f of n. So that means that g of n is a asymptotically tight bound for f of n. With this, first of all, we know that g of n cannot be negative, okay? If it's negative, that doesn't make much sense. Even this function just doesn't make much sense because if you input a million users, your time it takes to run is gonna increase. If it's negative, that means you either run on a supercomputer or something or some, it, it gets faster while there's more data points to process. That doesn't make any sense. So we know that this has to be non-negative, okay? It has to be positive. That's what theta g of n means. Theta g of n is equal to f of n um, if there exists c1, c2, positive constant, and n0. n0 is all these, a starting point where all these connected to each other, okay? such that it's between zero, C1, G1, zero, C1, G, N, zero, and F of N. So F of N is between these. For all N that's greater than or equal to N zero. This means such that, by the way, if you don't know the notation. Theta G of N is equal to F of N if there exists two constants, C1, C2, that bounds it between it. C1 times G of N is less than or equal to F of N, and F of N is less than or equal to C2 times G of N, okay? That's what this, theta notation means, okay? So 
and you could figure out all the the values of what it is and but let's look back at this equation let's look at these constants as you can see if you were to continually graph many many data points that they figured out you could actually see that most of these values constants that tangent inverse pi and sine square 3.2 pi those don't matter anymore as we reach in more infinity and infinity what really matters is the, the constants that bounds uh, g of n and uh, c to a g of n okay that's what really matters so we could actually throw those away so these constants don't matter anymore so we actually could just call it theta of n and the reason why it's theta of n is because there exists uh, two constants that is going to bound n towards f of n function okay so f of n is is approximate to theta of n Right, so like in this case, our g of n would be just n, a function of one straight line, and that's where it bounds this function. There exists two constants that we could bound are the regular straight line towards this f of n, of this crazy, ridiculous function, okay? So that, that, that's what this means. Okay, now let's talk about O notation. So let's say we graph the same time function as before. I give you a bunch of input values, and you graph how long your algorithm takes, and then your function looks something like this, okay? If I could find another function that bounds it above, an upper bound function of this function, f of n, then I could analyze this, right? So before here, we've tried to found two constants that could bound between this function, g of n, but this time we, we are just trying to find one function that could bound this function towards. So let's call this, let's call the function look like that, okay? And this function, we'll call it g of n, and it's just one, one constant multiplied. Well, we call g of n asymptotic big O notation. Big O notation, O of g of n, is going to equal to f of n if there exists a constant c1 multiplied c1 and n0 n0 is just like a starting point here we'll call it where they both cross n0 such that 0 is between f of n and f of n is less than or equal to c g of n for all n is greater than or equal to n0 okay so when we say this is a big O of n square or big O of n. It means that there exists a a um like like if when we say the time complexity is big O, so this is big O notation, big O. When we say something is big O of n, it means that there exists a constant multiplied by n that bounds this your algorithm's time function above it. Okay? So there exists a function, whatever this function is, as it approaches infinity, right? That multiplies by a constant, bounds it above your algorithm's time function. Okay, that's what they mean. So this big O means is the upper bound limit for this function. And as you can see here, initially, your big O function might actually be not as efficient as your, your normal function, as you can see here. Because like some of this might actually increase faster or slower than your original function. So big O notation might not actually be best case to work with sometimes for small values. I'm, for, I'm saying for small values, right? Because it's like the rate of increase. That's basically what the uh, big O notation means. You could also say like F of N. So when, okay, so when F of N is equal to G, uh, big O of G of N, you could also write it as, as a member of G of N, O of G of N, O of G of N. So what they're saying is that here, what they mean is using set theory, it's just a subset of it. So theta g of n is a subset of O of g of n because it's a small part of it. This is bounded above and this, this is squeezed between two constants. So a small part is going to be a, a subset of a larger part. Okay, that's what that means. Big O notation means it's, there's an upper bound tight limit. Your time complexity is so that your time of your algorithm, that's what it means. There's also another case where we could think about omega notation, I think. I think omega notation is a lower bound. Omega notation, I'll draw it out. An omega notation looks like this. This is your time function. And this this is omega, so it's bounded below. Like you have a lower function. Uh, technically, you could write any function that's actually bounded below, if you could just find a constant. That's what this means. And um, most, but most of the time, we don't really care about this. Because like we really care uh, about the... Like the lower bound doesn't really mean much. Sometimes it does. I'll just write the mathematical notation. G of n is equal to 
f of n if there exists c one n zero such that zero is less than c g n which is less than an f of n for all n greater than or equal n naught n naught is just like where they intersect yeah that's what this big omega notation means so another thing we could think about is a little o notation a little o notation so sometimes you find a function that's actually not as tight as your f of n function let's say the bound 2n square is equal to big O of n square, right? This is a tight function, right? If you were to bound it between the line, like an upper bound, we know that this is 2n square is bounded by n square, right? So there exists a, a constant c such that c times n square is above 2n square, right? So that, that is a tight bound, but sometimes it's not as asymptotically bound. So like um, you could say that two of n is equal to O of n square. You could write that. I mean, it's not it's not wrong. There might exist a function, like a time constant multiplied by n square that is going to be above 2n, right? You could, you could write that. It's not tight. It's not tight. It's not like a tight bound, right? What do we do? We use a little o notation. So little o, o notation is to describe a upper bound that is not tight. Like it's not gonna squeeze between it. This is how you mathematically define it. G of n, f of n, positive, c greater than zero. There exists, exists an n not the beginning one, greater than zero such that um, zero is less than or equal to f of n, is less than c g of n for all n that is greater than or equal to n not. So example, 2n is big little o of n square, right? There exists a constant multiplied by n square that is above 2n, and it's not a tight, like it's not a tight bound. But you cannot say that 2n square of this, like this doesn't make sense. This, this, this function is bounded tightly. n square is bounded tightly to 2n square. Like there does exist a constant such that like um, that is bounded above 2n squared and it is tight, okay? So yeah, that's all of the asymptotic notation. Um, you, you might say that the big O notation of big O and little o are similar, but the main difference is that the bound holds for some constant c, but in the little bound, the boundary is holds for all constants. C. So in, so th this is similar to big O notation, but so the main difference is that um, f of n we say f of n is big O of g of n times g of n, right? This bound, this bound is true for some c, c greater than zero, but for um, for little o, we say it's bounded for all c. So little o of g of n, this is bounded, f of n is less than the constant c times g of n for all constants c greater than zero. In little o notation, f of n becomes insignificant relative, relative to g of n as it approaches infinity. Excuse me. But yeah, that's basically it. We can talk about the rate of growth for each function. All right, guys. So if we look at this picture here, this picture shows every single um, big O notation of every single running time of a function of big O of f of n. So if you look at this notation, um, we see that n factorial is the worst. And the reason why is because it, the, it grows very quickly. Like the time it takes, like the rate of change, the time uh, for the time for uh, the values grows way faster in terms of time compared to the other functions. So like this time grows way too of way faster compared to uh, O of C of n, uh, O of C to the n. Okay, so O C to the N means uh, an exponential function, right? So like O of two to the N or three to the N, right? Finding like um, like brute force algorithms that, that, that uses a lot of um, time complexity, right? It uses, it grows, the algorithm grows really fast. And uh, let's look at this, this, this graph, O of C, uh, of O of N to the C. Okay, uh, this is a, con, uh, a polynomial a polynomial graph. So O of n to the C is like O of n square, n third, n fourth. And those values are like um, using like a certain number of loops. 
uh, O of n squared is like uh, using two for loops. If you like uh, traverse all the way through both of them, that's like O of n squared. O of n cubed might be like use three for loops. O of n fourth, stuff like that, like exponential, uh, not exponential, polynomial, polynomial time. O of n to the c. And then here we have uh, O of n log n, and that's like that's like the time complexity of quick sort sorting algorithms. Good sorting algorithms. O of n, this is a good time complexity of, it uses the, um, it's like linear, it's like one one pass takes through is a good time complexity. Uses one for loop, so very efficient as it approaches larger and larger. Um, then we have O of log n, which is also very good, very good. Um, it's better than O of n, because like it, it doesn't, the time it takes does not approach that, the time it takes uh, doesn't approach that much when it goes to infinity. And then we have constant O of one, and that's that's the best because it only takes takes like uh, I don't know takes very constant time. So like th that means when when we say constant time, it means like it runs like five seconds, six seconds, seven seconds. Like no matter how what the input size is, it'll still run five or six seconds, right? Five seconds, six seconds. And there there are some algorithms that are like that, right? Like where if you just Turn it on; it just automatically is on, right? Like uh, algorithms that are constant; it just uses a certain number of space. So yeah, that's this. Um, that's all the the graphs of the time complexities of O of n, and I explained all the time complexities. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Rate, comment, subscribe. I'll check you guys later. Peace.